Okay. Uh, today is our great pleasure to have uh, Professor Xiao Jun Ye uh, from uh, Georgia State University. He's now a social professor uh, in the Department of Mathematics. Uh, Xiao Jun obtained his uh, uh, doctorate degree in mathematics from the uh, University of the Florida in back to 2011. His main research includes analysis and the numerical methods for stochastic point process on networks, modeling, competition, competitions of optimal transport and applications. A theory and the competition in machine learning with application in deep learning and the image processing. Okay, Xiao Jing. Okay, thank you, uh, Rungjie, for the invitation. And uh, uh, thank you for coming to my talk. And today we're going to talk about uh, one of our recent work on inverse optimal transport. And the goal is to learn the uh, cost function for the optimal transport. Um, so here's our line. I'm going to first discuss or talk about the uh, optimal transport, uh, just give a background. And then we'll, uh, I will talk about the inverse optimal transport. It's a problem that we're trying to solve here. And we uh, consider algorithm for solving this problem uh, in a discrete and a continuous case separately. And then if uh, the time allows, I will talk about some generalizations of uh, the approach we take and make a conclusion afterwards. Okay, um, so I guess some of you have been, uh, or at least know that what is what is tra optimal transport is. Uh, so suppose we're given two measurable spaces, X and Y. Uh, you, for now, you can think that there are some subspace or just the entire uh, n dimensional Euclidean space. And, uh, and then you, uh, we are given a cost function that is uh, defined on the product space of X and Y. And uh, it is a mapping from the, the product space to a real number. And this is uh, the cost of function that eventually we're trying to recover. But say right now, I suppose this cost function is given. And then um, we can, uh, for any given marginal distributions, mu, which is uh, a distribution on space X, and mu is a space as a distribution on space Y, then we can uh, consider the, the so-called optimal transport problem or OT problem. And the problem is that uh, we're trying to find this joint distribution pi, and I use a superscript stream means that uh, this pi may change uh, according to the cost function, uh, as you can imagine because the objective function here will change. So the objective function is the, uh, uh, the in integration of this product, which is the accumulated cost generated by this joint uh, distribution. And this joint distribution uh, has marginals mu and nu. So this is the constraint that we want to impose. So we're searching for the joint distribution pi whose marginals are mu and nu, such that the uh, overall cost uh, this integral here is minimized, okay? And uh, this set uh, pi of mu nu is just uh, the set of joint distributions whose marginals are these two, uh, two given marginal distributions, okay? So this is the, uh, the so-called optimal transport problem and it has, uh, has been studied for many years. Um, back to, I think the, this formulation is given by Kandinovich in back in 1950s. And uh, I think it, uh, most of the people are studying or theoretical optimal transport is to use a specific choice of this cost. For example, it could be norm or something sim similar to norms. And the, in this case, they were going to find out what is uh, pi is. Okay, so this is optimal transport. And this is the optimal solution for the, for the problem, uh, which we call optimal transport. But the objective function of this problem, or if you compute, compute this and you plug this back in here, then what you get is the so-called lessons and distance, okay, depending on the choice of your C. Okay, and this distance is actually a distance between two probability distributions. Okay, so it has many applications. Uh, and it has, it has uh, lots of connections with, uh, with different branches of mathematics. Uh, for example, it is related to Riemann geometry, uh, PDE is uh, optimization and the probability theory. And uh, it has many applications right now. Uh, a very emerging type, application of OT is in uh, machine learning. Uh, I guess some of you have been have learned about the GAN or the generative adversarial, uh, generative adversarial network. And the uh, one extension or variation of that is called double GAN or Wessenstein GAN, which is to use the Wessenstein distance uh, to measure the, to measure the, uh, the uh, generated data, to measure the distribution of the generated data and uh, the, the given data. Okay, so it's uh, 
the application that we're also uh, we're also going to consider here in, in machine learning. And it also has applications in statistics because it involves probability, also in economics and social science. Okay? And our, actually our motivation was from the uh, machine learning and social science application. Okay, so that was that OT, uh, but the uh, computational wise, or what is a a uh, very popular variation of the OT is this so-called entropy regress OT, which is the same as the OT, except that there is additional entropy term uh, added to the objective function. So this entropy term is the, uh, this H is the entropy term of the uh, joint distribution. So, and this epsilon is a regularization parameter. Okay. Uh, uh, there, is different, there are different ways to interpret why or explain why this term will be useful or um, necessary in certain applications. I'm not going to talk about those, uh, especially in social science. There are very nice explanation, explanation why uh, this entropy term will be a, a good plus to this, uh, to this problem. And uh, the key we're going to use here, or the property we're going to use here is that this regularized OT uh, has a dual form that is pretty, uh, has a very nice properties. So the dual problem of the entropy regularized OT as I just mentioned is this. So uh, the primal variable we have, we we're considering pre previously is the joint distribution pi. But the, the dual variable corresponding to the uh, Lagrange multipliers of the two equality constraints, uh, the two equality constraints are given by the marginal constraints since the marginals of pi must be equal to mu and nu uh, respectively. So uh, for each of these two uh, constraints, we introduce one uh, multiplier, uh, which are the alpha and beta. Then we can rewrite the primal problem into this dual form. And uh, this is a dual variable, a dual objective function. Um, and uh, the problem becomes the maximization with respect to these two multipliers. And a very good, uh, very important observation uh, here is that although the original optimal transport problem in the primal form has constraints right here, as we see, it has constraints here, but the dual problem doesn't have constraints. Um, and it's just a purely maximization problem. Problem, And the, the reason is that when we take the first order optimality of this, and then you find the maximizer of and beta, and you realize that the constraint for the uh, dual problem is, are automatically satisfied. So we don't need to worry about the uh, constraint in the dual form. Uh, when we derive this from the entropy regular OT. So that's one thing. The second thing is that this problem is convex in R and beta jointly. So it's actually a convex, oh, sorry, the objective function here is concave. So when we take the uh, minimization of the negative of the objective function, it becomes a convex optimization problem. So that's why there's a, there's a nice problem with uh, you know, optimization per, per step perspective. And, uh, 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 it is, as we said, it's equivalent to the uh, primal problem. And uh, what we're going to use here is that the uh, optimal transport uh, pi C, which is the solution for the primal, primal problem, can be explicitly write, written as a function of the dual variables. So suppose we solve this dual problem, we got this alpha C, beta C, and then we can get the uh, optimal, primal prob optimal primal solution uh, in this explicit form. Okay. And this is a very nice property for the regularized OT, and uh, it doesn't, it is not necessarily true for the standard OT or the original OT. So that's a very nice property of the uh, dual problem. Okay, and uh, now there are many other uh, nice properties of the, uh, or nice features of this dual form. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few of them. Uh, the entropy term will be, uh, will, be help, will help this problem to be more robust to the noise and the missing data. And uh, it is approximation of the original OT if we set the parameter of the localization epsilon to uh, approaching to zero. And uh, uh, I think I'm going to mention that the, uh, the, the problem itself, the problem itself is actually strictly convex in uh, R and beta. So uh, it will have a unique solution. And also uh, when we consider that the entropy regularized OT or the dual form of the entropy regularized OT here, uh, we can find very fast algorithm to solve it, it's called the single hall algorithm and uh, uh, for the discrete case. And this is like a matrix scaling method and that's pretty fast in practice. Okay. Um, 
And uh, this is in comparison to the standard solver for OT, which is to solve the primal problem using linear program. And uh, that is pretty slow compared to the single one. Okay, and uh, now goes, let's go back to the, uh, the or original goal here. So our goal is to learn the cost. Instead of doing the optimal transport, given to marginals, given the cost that we're try, uh, trying to find the, uh, the optimal transport plan, uh, here we're going to do the reverse way or the inverse way, which is to learn the cost function C, given the uh, transport plan. Okay? And the reason for doing this is because uh, you can see that the cost function is the only uh, major parameter in the OT problem. So given different, you give a different cost function, you will get different solution, uh, uh, different optimal transport plan. So it will affect the optimal transport plan a lot. And in practice, uh, although people want to use Western and distance or use optimal transport to, to, for their specific applications, but the choice of this cost function is uh, very influential and uh, will impact their result a lot. If they just uh, choose, these are just a careful, care, careless enough to choose some random cost, the result they got could be completely deviated from the true one. Okay, so they will cause some devi uh, the bias if you choose the cost um, uh, in the wrong way. Okay, and the, usually the cost that people choose in practice will be just simple ones like the norm of uh, x minus y or something like square of the norm. Uh, something similar to this, but they're really too simple to to um, capture the the mechanisms of the of the true of the true cost in, in practice. Okay, so that's one. Uh, that's the reason why we're uh, trying to learn the cost. And the question now becomes, how do we learn it? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, suppose in this case we're going to uh, suppose that we are given the uh, optimal transport plan pi. Um, either is just the direct uh, distribution or is given by the samples. And from this given pi, we want to recover what is the original cost or ground cost. And uh, uh, what we're going to do here is to, to set up the problem and to see how do we formulate this problem. And eventually we want to develop a fast algorithm to solve for this inverse OT problem, uh, finding this cost from the, or recover the cost from the observed data. And uh, we're going to consider this in two different scenarios, uh, the discrete case and the continuous case, because the uh, systems are quite different. And uh, uh, the algorithm are, will look very differently as well. Okay, and uh, the applications. Um, well, uh, as one thing that we can uh, immediately see is that the cost tells us lots of things about the underlying matchings. If we see the uh, optimal transport, transport plan data, uh, it's actually given by lots of matchings between the X and the Y or the, the individuals from the two distributions. And uh, if you see this Y, you, um, you will be wondering how, what is the underlying cost that, that give this result or uh, reduce this kind of result. Uh, one famous application in social, social science in, is about the marriage. For example, you have a group of men and a group of women, and you can treat two, these two groups as two distributions. And in each group, uh, the people are formed by some uh, features. So each person has a feature vector. And uh, you first, for example, in the distribute case, you can, you can characterize these people, for example, the, the men, into different groups. And then uh, you observed the matching of, pe of a woman and men uh, from these different groups. And you will wonder, what is uh, the uh, award or what is the cost for making one of such couple. So you observe these matchings and you realize that what is the main feature that uh, match two people uh, or match the couple. For example, is it about education? It's about uh, religion or it's about like uh, something simpler like height, height or like uh, weight or something, uh, some simple feature like that. So the social scientists the want to or, uh, uncover this relation uh, using the optimal transport, or inverse optimal transport, okay? Uh, so that's one application. The other application uh, is to predict or recommend new matchings. Because if you know what is the cost, then given two new distributions, then you can easily compute the optimal transport, just do the forward OT afterwards. But uh, the key is that what is, the what is the proper choice of the cost? 
And if you can learn them from the data, then it will be more accurate for the future data that have similar, same or similar distributions. Uh, rather than you, uh, if you do this uh, just by a handcraft cost, then you get a different, then you get the wrong result, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, um, so the inverse OT, um, compared to OT, the inverse OT uh, was studied uh, not long ago. Uh, the earliest one that we saw is probably from 2014 by social scientists. And uh, it, uh, what I listed so far probably are all the, the, the work that had been uh, developed for inverse OT uh, implicitly or explicitly. Um, and uh, I categorize this into two groups again. Uh, the distributed case, which is just to, as we saw, as we will see later, it will be just uh, to recover the cost of matrix. Since in the distributed case, the cost is simply a matrix uh, to be recovered. And the in continuous case, we are actually recovering a function. Uh, as we said, the cost is a function. It's a mapping from the part, uh, product space of x and y to a uh, real number. Okay. All right, so now let's see uh, how we're going to formulate this problem. Um, so the motivation is pretty simple. Suppose we are given the uh, observation, uh, which is the optimal transfer plan that we denoted by pi hat. This is something given that we want to recover the cost, which is the C here, such that the uh, induced optimal transfer plan or the plan induced by this cost the C uh, is this pi super super C. And we want to minimize the KL distance between the observed pi hat and this optimal transport plan induced by the cost C here. And we can also add some other constraint or realization of the cost function uh, by this RC term. Okay, so this is a pretty intuitive way to minimize, uh, to find this optimal transport, uh, the ground cost C. Um, we, we can choose other uh, uh, distance here, but I'm going to explain why we choose this one specifically. So just to, uh, just to uh, remind, this DKL is the KL distance between two probability density functions. Uh, it's given by this way. And the, the pi hat is the given observations for data or some uh, matching data. So it's just like a pairs of xi, x and y, which are reserved uh, as the matchings uh, in the observation data. And the RC is the regularization, uh, as we're going to uh, impose later. And uh, this pi c is the, uh, uh, the optimal transport plan induced by the cost function C. Okay, so that is the motivation. So we formulate this or summarize this into this for a cost of learning problem. Uh, we, the inverse OT is just to do this cost of function learning by finding, uh, to find this minimizer C such that the uh, KL distance between the observed one and the induced one is minimized, or plus this regularization is minimized where this pi c is under the constraint uh, in the second line here, so is the optimal transport plan induced by the cost function c. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the feature of this is that this, um, we want this pi c to be close to ob observation. At the same time, we want to add certain regularization since this problem just itself is uh, underdetermined. Uh, we can find an infinite many uh, Cost such that they induce the same pi, same same pi c, and they are all going to match this pi hat very well. So we're going to impose certain realizations or constraints to this c later. Uh, but the challenge here is pretty obvious uh, because this pi c induces is came from a another constraint, which is given by this lower level uh, optimization problem. So this is a typical bi level optimization problem, which is considered uh, very challenging in the optimization community because that the constraint itself is not a trivial optimization problem to solve. And when this one is coupled with the upper level optimization problem, this one can be pretty expensive to solve uh, if it's possible, very expensive, or it's just uh, extremely difficult to solve efficiently. Okay? And also uh, we, have, we have decided, we have determined what this, this term, uh, this KL term and this constraints are, but also since I just mentioned, as I just mentioned, the problem is underdetermined. How do we choose this regularization so that we can reach to the optimal or to reach to the uh, cost function we wanted rather than some random one from a, a large pool of, of choices? Okay, and we're going to tackle this issue in our, in our work. 
Okay, so the idea work to do this is pretty simple actually. Um, so what do we do is Shady, may I ask a question? So how okay. sensitive of, of, of the epsilon? So because uh, here you approximate that, right? Then you have the probation of the C and, and those things. That's that's a very good question. Actually, uh, it is very sensitive for the for the forward problem. Uh, as you may know, that the synchronous algorithm highly depend depend on this uh, epsilon here. Uh, exactly. But it is not as sensitive as in our problem. The reason is uh, the reason is um, what we observe is just a C. It is C or C divided by epsilon doesn't matter to us because we are kind of learning the cost is just a relative uh, uh, weight on different pairs of x and y. So we can just assume that epsilon is equal to one, and then we whatever you actually recover is C divided by epsilon. And that's just a constant scaling of the cost, and it doesn't affect or you know the future, uh, the future uh, matching. So that's the interest, yeah, that's yeah. the interesting well, aspect. But uh, I should put well. maybe I should put this way: so when you add a, an entropy regression or not adding the entropy regression, that will affect a lot. Yes, that will yeah that will affect. Um, one thing that will affect is is that the uh, the PC here we are going to recover. Will be if you have the regularization, then the PC we are going to recover here will be non-sparse, will be dense everywhere. Yeah, because there should be no zeros at all. But this yeah. kind of may have zero. So uh, in that case, matching the two could be a little bit difficult, especially when the pad hat has lots of zeros. Because in general, if you do the original OT, the pad hat may be very sparse. So yep. in this case, the matching could be a little bit different. Difficult, but uh, we can always perturb this pad hat by some like small uh, density on the the zero uh, observations. Then you can still match. But the point here is that if you give such a pad hat, and then what we are going to the, what the inverse OT will do is that they will treat this pad hat like um, at certain locations the property is really low, and in those case they will just make this C very large at those places. Because they think that the, the why we didn't re observe certain pairings or certain matching is because the cost there is too large, and this can be explained by the c divided by epsilon. Since your epsilon is very close to zero, then it's pretty much like the original t. And in that case, uh, if if this c is a little bit large, then divided by epsilon, it will be much larger than you know relatively it will be much larger than the uh, much larger value, and uh, in this case, it will discourage matching at those places. But if you just look at the inverse problem, inverse OT problem here, it doesn't matter uh, because C divided by epsilon is C divided by epsilon is the one we were actually recovering, not C itself. And there's okay. actually no way to recover the C itself because you know uh, if you just given the 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 uh, uh, the pi, uh, we don't know what is the relative you know uh, weight or relative cost uh, between two two pairs of x and y. Right. If you look at here, there, uh, we just know what is the relative uh, magnitude or cost there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So, so as I said, that we're going to solve the problem by a very simple approach. So the approach here is that recall I mentioned earlier that the entropy regularizability has an advantage. The if you can solve the dual problem, then the primal problem has a closed form. Can be written explicitly written uh, can be explicitly written as a function of the dual forms, uh, dual problems or uh, sorry dual solutions. So suppose this alpha beta are the solution to the dual problem, and then you can just plug in the get this primal uh, solution or solution to the primal problem. And if you can do this, then recall that this KL is the uh, um, or should I say is is given by is given by this. So we just need to plug in because this pi hat is given. This pi c is that uh, the exponential of those things, right? It's exponential of this. Just plug this in, and then you do some simple algebra. You end up with this, and this is really similar to the uh, to the uh, the dual form. Uh, if you ignore this R c here, then this two these two together is actually the dual form. It's actually the uh, optimal solution of the dual problem. So the reason I'm saying that is remember that this is the dual problem. This part or this part is the the dual problem. Given the cost of c, you can solve for alpha and beta by like this. But once you solve the alpha and the beta, 
and you have this term right here. But this term for the optimum alpha and beta, this term exactly is the pi c. And you're taking the integral of pi c, which is the probability distribution. And what you end up with is this, this integral here is term completely equal to one. And when it is equal to one, then uh, this term, the last term is just a minus epsilon. So that's why uh, we get the optimal solution, optimal dupe solution, alpha c and beta c, then this part will be just equal to the maximum uh, of the of the uh, dual problem. And then you can see the matching between these two terms and these two terms. So you can substitute this by this plus epsilon. So you can put this back. And then what you end up with is this cost learning model that we propose. Um, this is just the, the regularization. And uh, this is the two uh, linear functions in alpha and beta. This is a linear function in terms of the uh, cost of function C. And uh, finally, this is the, the common term from the due form from here. It's just the inheritance from there. Uh, and what the, um, uh, some feature that we can observe from this, final, this model is that this problem here itself, it's not constrained at all. There's no constraint. Unlike the bilevel, uh, optimization formulation we had earlier, there's no constraint at all. And it's a convex problem in terms of our urban beta C. It's actually jointly convex in urban beta C if we don't consider this RC yet. Uh, well, if, if you impose a, a non-convex regularization here, then of course the problem becomes non-convex. But before doing this, before you add any uh, uh, regularization here, the, the other terms they get together is unconstrained and convex. Okay? Uh, and uh, an interesting feature is that if you, if you right now we don't want to recover the cost, suppose we know the cost, and if we know the cost, then this middle term is gone because the cost is given, this pi hat is given, right? So it is, we don't need it at all. Uh, and this term will be, this term and these two terms together will be just the dual problem uh, for the for the OT. And uh, this is also how we're going to develop a fast algorithm afterwards. Okay, so to summarize what we just got, uh, originally we uh, modeled a inverse OT problem or learning cost function by minimizing this, uh, doing this bi-level optimization. Uh, objective function is the KL plus the regularization. The constraint is this uh, minimization problem solving the entropy regularized OT. Uh, and then we show that, it's, that this one is actually equivalent to an unconstrained convex optimization problem as we showed uh, here is just the minimization it with respect to three variables. Alpha, beta are like the uh, the dual variables from the entropy regularized OT, and the C is the cost that we are trying to recover. And uh, we can easily show that these two problems are equivalent. Uh, and uh, if you can find some C that is solving the primal problem, uh, this problem, and it's the same C that is going to solve this this uh, new formulation. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the the foundation of our algorithm development later. Okay, uh, so there are many issues that, are, uh, that we need to discuss uh, regarding this formulation. For example, what, as we mentioned earlier, uh, the problem itself, uh, cost learning problem itself is a underdetermined problem. So it may, for a given cost, or for a given pi hat, it could be infinitely many solutions, infinitely many choices of cost. And uh, how are we going to determine which solution is the one that we want? Um, to this end, let's consider the objective function that we have here. We just have this regularization term. And uh, you know, if you have, if you did a variational model or did a, uh, some modeling using PDEs or variational models, you know that a typical way of uh, forming a inverse problem is to get this regularization term and also a data feeding term, right? So right now we have the regularization term, which is, you know, we can impose it later on, but uh, what's left can be considered as the data consistency term or data fidelity term. So we just aggregate all these terms, put them together as this E of R of beta C, and this uh, turns out to be uh, the data, data fidelity. And our solution, we prove that the solution will be, or the value of this E will be the same if your R of beta and C are equivalent in the following sense. Uh, we call this alpha, this choice of alpha and beta c is equivalent to another one. If and only for any x and y, this alpha plus beta minus c is equal. Okay? 
will be a constant value. If for every x and y and the x and the y, if these two are equal, then we say these two solutions are equivalent. And if you put if the two solutions are equivalent, then you put back into this theta, theta fidelity, you get exactly the same value. Okay. And that means um, they're equally good for this theta fidelity. And then we add the regularization to further select which one among this equivalent uh, equivalency uh, class is the optimal one that we want. Okay, so this will help us to narrow down which are the uh, classes of solution, you know, which one uh, we'll focus on, we will eventually reach to the equivalence class that contains all the solutions that minimize this, and then the uh, regularization will help us to, to further select. Okay, so uh, because of this, uh, this equivalency relation, we can find, we can define the quotient space. So this W is actually the choice of alpha, beta, and C. And uh, we do this equivalency just means that we, you know, just do this partition of uh, using this equivalency relation. And uh, for uh, one equivalent set, this is the old alpha and beta C that uh, have this equivalency, uh, equivalency relation. And then uh, a typical projection is that if you have alpha and beta C, you can just always project to the, uh, you know, representative of the, of the class, equivalency class. Okay, so you can think of this in, uh, in this way. So you have, suppose you have a, a this as your solution set, R from C, and the, what this equivalency class tells you is that you can partition this like uh, bundles or like uh, slides. On each slice, it represents the equivalent class. So on this class, it doesn't matter which point you're going to choose, uh, they all have the same mean here, okay? And your regularization is supposed to add this additional constraint so you can narrow down which one you actually want. But if you do not add that, then all of them look the same. So that's the idea. Uh, uh, so what do we derive here is that uh, if you have if you have uh, narrowed down this solution to uh, just look at uh, for each um, equivalence class, you just look at the solution on each of the equivalence class, and as I said, the E will be equivalent, or E will take the same value on each class, and the, the minimizer. Which we just need to look for the class that has the, that minimize the e, and we know that they all have the same value, so we don't care which one you are going to choose eventually. That is something that should be do, should be done by your uh, additional regularization. Um, so, for example, let's say if we boil down to the to actual uh, computation, uh, consider the discrete case when we have uh, where the probabilities becomes a probability simplex. So this is the uh, the syntax. Uh, so the mu and nu are just the probability vectors. And the joint distribution is just a matrix, uh, m by n matrix, such that the, uh, the row sum is equal to mu and the, the column sum equals to mu, just the two given marginal distributions. And the cost of the matrix is just a, a matrix. Right? It's the same size as this pi. So the inner product between the c and the pi will be just the inner product of these two matrices or the component-wise multiplication of the two and take the sum. And the, the, as I said, the cost of function learning just becomes a cost of matrix learning. So we're just trying to figure out what is the cost of matrix C here. Okay, and then we recall that you just use the discrete version of the inverse OT formulation we had earlier. And uh, that's, the, that's the one that we have. Uh, so you, instead of having the integrals, we just replace them by, by, by inner products. Because these are just the old vectors. And then, uh, so it's, uh, it's the same property that we have from the uh, inverse OT formulation. This is unconstrained. It is convex uh, in alpha, beta, and C before we added this uh, regularization term. And uh, it would reduce to the forward, uh, it would be reduced to the dual form of the forward OT when the C is fixed. And also, uh, we can use a single algorithm, which is kind of matrix fitting, to, to, to compute this alpha and beta C quickly. Okay. Um, so uh, the uniqueness solution, I'm going to go uh, quickly here. Uh, see, uh, um, as this is actually inherited from our observation before. Um, if we can narrow down, you can narrow down the solutions into different equivalency class. Then uh, for each class, there's only one class that has the minimum value. All the other classes have a value strictly bigger than that class. So that's, uh, and then we, we, within that class, we just need to narrow down to, to, the, uh, to the unique minimizer we want by adding this regularization. 
So one key feature from uh, one key uh, result we from, got from here is that if you can add this additional constraint that requires the cost to be symmetric, so the cost matrix here to be symmetric, and the diagonal entries are zero, then the cost will be unique. Okay, and this is a very really simple set, as you can imagine. If the cost is a symmetric a matrix with diagonal as zero, then the cost is unique. This includes lots of choices. For example, uh, I will see later. For example, you can imagine it's just a, a standard uh, distance matrix, or for example, x minus y, x minus y square. Anything like this are symmetric, and uh, the when x and y are equal, this is equal to zero. Right? So in this case, you can actually narrow down the when you find the equivalent, the minimizer uh, or minimizing equivalent class, then it's very easy to narrow down which one uh, of the cost is actually the solution. Can narrow down to the unique one. And doing this uh, requires a projection to this space, uh, as we'll see soon later. Uh, the projection is just to do this. If you got a C, you just uh, add this transpose and then divide by two, and then you got this C, uh, which is not necessarily having the diagonal zero, right? It's just the plug in zero. You just set the diagonal to be zero, and then the projection is done. So it's very simple and cheap projection to perform. And also, it covers a lot of uh, different choices of the, the uh, uh, cost matrix. For example, if you have some, if your x, I, x and the y need to be mapped using uh, as a feature mapping, so you can design a neural network to map your observed x and y, or x i, x j here, uh, to a certain space, and you can do the distance, the standard distance in that space. And the, the cost of function can be as complicated as that. And you can just train your neural network uh, based on that, based on that observation. Okay, and uh, um, there are different choices for uh, the parameterization of the cost. As I said here, you can do this, or you can assume that your cost is given by this uh, bilinear form, uh, where this G and D are given, and the cost is just uh, a, a product of this three, where this A is to be recovered. This is from the social science or the marriage example I mentioned. This A will tell you the uh, matching uh, coefficient for different features. And uh, you can also consider that your cost is a sparse matrix, or it's a low rank matrix, and you can just add this uh, Euclidean norm as a regularization. Or if you know the matrix, the cost matrix is sparse, then you can, you can just add this. Okay. So there are different choices. It's, up to, it's, a, it's a more uh, problem specific, so we're not to discuss that more here. Okay, so the algorithm uh, is pretty simple. Given the, the pi hat is a given data, and the, the marginals are given, and what we're going to do here, here is that uh, you do this iterations, pretty similar to the sinkhole, uh, where if you just have this two, for example, uh, you set this k to be this, where the c is in the forward OT, uh, we're going to do the sinkhole algorithm for the, for the due problem, the entropy regularized OT, the c is, c is fixed. So in that case, you're just uh, assign this value to k, and then just iterate this two only if you do the forward OT. And this u and v will give you, eventually give you the, the dual variables. But since the cost, uh, since we're trying to recover the cost here, so the alpha, beta, c are both, they're all unknowns. So we also need to update this cost of c here. So what we update is just uh, do this matrix of, uh, scaling as in single algorithm, and then do another matrix scaling, uh, like here. So the pi hat is a given object, uh, a given matching data, or a given mat matching matrix, and then divided by this. Uh, and finally, you can do a proximal operator on this on this cost. Uh, essentially, this is actually the C here because uh, the relation between this and this. So this is just uh, doing a proximal operator on the C. And then you update the C. And then next round, you recompute this K and do this. So the cost is pretty cheap. Uh, you know, this is just, uh, these are all component-wise competi competition. This is the matrix uh, vector multiplication. And also this is matrix of vector modification, but others are basically just a point-wise or component-wise computation. This is uh, a little bit tricky. It depends on what is this, uh, the regularization you chose. Uh, but for example, if the, it is the one that uh, required to be just a symmetric like this one, then as I said, the proximal or the, the projection will be extremely easy to do. And this gives us a, a this actually covers a lot of uh, uh, cost function used in practice. And that's why I probably have um, uh, more applications than, than many other uh, choices. Okay. And then uh, let's see a result. 
we just do a, did a simple experiment. So we used uh, the uh, uh, this kind of cost, for example, i minus j divided uh, to the power p. p could be any positive number. Uh, it could be even negative. It's just that if it's negative, you need to set the diagonal to zero. But otherwise, p can be any number. And uh, this are, I think the p was uh, 0.5, 1, 2, 3. You can see that in either case, the recovery cost is uh, pretty close to the true one. And uh, this is the button, this is done by the matrix scaling algorithm we just described here, which is done extremely fast. Okay, uh, we look at the we look at the objective function value, or this is probably it's more the second one right here is more informative. Uh, it tells us the relative error, uh, which is the relative error between the recovered cost and the ground cost, ground truth cost in terms of the iteration of the algorithm we just mentioned. You know that for each iteration, that computation cost is really low. And you just do a few hundred of equations that the error reduces to tens of negative four or even lower, okay? Uh, depending on different choice of you. Sorry, the projection you're choosing, the convex, the convex set you're choosing is just that the symmetric matrix? Yeah, we just chose it as a symmetric matrix. Symmetric okay, and, and the diagonal is zero. So it's zero. pretty easy to compute. That's it. Yeah. So that's why this, the computation cost is basically like the sinkhole, like a the forward problem. But we can use that same cost for doing the doing the inverse problem, and this is a this is actually quite different, uh, quite a improvement compared to the existing method. Almost all existing method, I would have said that all of the existing method are doing this high level formulation, and uh, uh, you need to solve one forward OT in each iteration, and you know solving for one forward OT requires doing this single iteration. So you basically need the in, in, uh, inner iterations. Uh, for for uh, for each iteration, so the inner and outer. But right now we don't have any inner, just the outer. And yeah, but this, is, this is like you do the alternative optimization. But one way is like you solve that uh, minimize, you, you achieve the minimizer. The other way is like you do top of gradient descent. This is a, you you can you sort of turn turn down the inner loop. Oh uh, well, if you do the if you do the standard bilateral setting, that is. Uh, the, if you do that, the convergence probably is very difficult to achieve. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. But here we can prove convergence even. Just mm -hmm. uh, and the cost is still as low as the forward OT. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is the marriage data I mentioned earlier. And, uh, uh, we recovered this cost matrix A. So I was, oh, sorry, the uh, uh, matching matrix A, which is uh, used to parameterize the cost as a bilinear form. So the G and D are feature vectors, as we mentioned. For each different group, for different groups in men or in women, um, the, the combination of the different characteristic trails like the education, the irresponsibility, the discipline, order, detail. I think these are a few of them, but the, the, the complete table is much larger. We cannot put it in here, which is like the few of the features. And these are the features that to describe each group in men or women. And this A will tell you. What is the matching coefficient between these this things? Uh, and they have the social scientists as a, uh, they have a nice interpretation of this matrix, which I, I don't really quite understand, but I hope that it tells something that in, uh, in their study. And uh, so that's all the, about the uh, continuous uh, discrete case. Uh, the uh, major feature that we, we can achieve here is to do the continuous inverse OT. Remember that the cost. Uh, in this case, it's a mapping from the product space to the set of real numbers. So this C is actually a, a function. And if we do the continuous case, we consider the uh, X and Y are from Euclidean space, D dimensional Euclidean space, and D could be large, uh, five, 10, or even higher. And in that case, it's impossible to discretize because if you need to discretize that, the, uh, the size of the two probability vectors, mu and nu, will increase exponentially fast. Uh, and that makes this computation extremely, the mu and nu will be extremely large, and the pi will be also extremely large. In that case, the computation will be you know, basically impossible. Uh, so for, high, for the continuous case, what do we do is to parameterize, since alpha, beta, c are just functions, let's parameterize them as neural networks. The, uh, for example, if the x is a d-dimensional uh, d -dimensional vector, then the alpha is just the mapping from rd to r1. So your neural network is just parameterized with the input layer dimension as D and the output, uh, output layer dimension one. And similar for the C, the, you just create a neural network, 
the input layer dimension is 2D and the output layer uh, dimension is just one. And they will give, give you an approximation, uh, it will give you a parameterized function. And what you do is just to plug in this neural network into this framework and then train this neural network such that the cost uh, eventually will turn out to be a neural network parameter by the optimal parameter uh, that you saw from here. And uh, the, the difference from the previous one is that right now we only, in the high dimensional case, we will not be able to get the actual property density function. What we get is the, the matching data. So we have the pairs X and Y. So we have different pairs. Uh, each pair has its X and Y to describe the, the observed pairing. And then we can uh, substitute the, the integrals. Previously, we have alpha times mu or integral of alpha times mu. And then in this case, the, it's just the expectation of alpha under the, the marginal distribution mu, and similar for the other two terms. And the, since we have the data, then we can just replace the expectation by empirical expectation, just plug in the samples, uh, which xi and the yi, these are the samples we observe from the, uh, as the given pi hat. They're just plug in and the, everything will be just uh, computable. Okay. The, uh, the only key uh, difficulty is in this term, the last term, which requires a dimension which is interpret the integration in the high dimensional space or in uh, RD by RD space. And uh, uh, there are some recent work that developed to solve, um, to, uh, to solve high dimensional PDEs and uh, the essentially difficulty is also in this. But if it's not too high, then the, this one can be easily approximated by, by Monte Carlo. For example, your D is like five over 10, uh, the, the approximation here is very efficient. So I'm seeing approximation. It's a, a easy way to, to do this. Uh, to do this, okay. And I think the algorithm will be similar. I will be just uh, training a you know training a neural network, training three neural networks, and uh, the uh, objective function or the last function will be just given by uh, given by this term, given by the one here. And a good thing about here uh, here is that the regularization. If you have certain regularization or constraint. You don't really have to add this separately. You can just impose this into your neural network. For example, if you want your neural network to output positive values, for example, C here, then you can just put a relook uh, as the last activation or activation of the last output layer, then it will be automatically non-negative. Okay? And or if you want it to be symmetric, that's also very easy to implement as a using neural network. So you can actually integrate the regularization into the neural network where you design. Uh, so I will quickly go over here just to show you some result. Uh, so this is the, again, we tested on a synthetic data uh, where the cost is given by X minus Y to the power, to the power uh, P. Okay. I think we tried two dimensional case here. Um, and uh, this shows the loss function, uh, shows the relative error. Uh, when we evaluate the relative error, we just use the, uh, the network uh, we got. And then evaluate them at the grid points and compare with the true one. And this is how we evaluate this relative error. And also objective function, as you can see, it will decrease uh, for all the cases. And uh, we tried some very complicated ones. For example, if cost is, is given by that, which is non-symmetric, it's not even a distance. Uh, and you can still recover it pretty well. Uh, I think I'm gonna stop here. I well the student other student also did some experiment on the on the uh, color transfer which I didn't include here. Uh, but I'm pretty satisfied with the, the result we got so far, which is uh, tackled both of the continuous and discrete case. And uh, the, the, the algorithm will be really fast and efficient. And then we can recover some uh, really strange cost. And uh, I, think that's, I think that's all I want to say. And uh, this is the reference that uh, I mentioned. So this, the, the talk here is given are you based on this first, uh, uh, first paper here? And, um, I guess that's all. Thank you. Okay, very good. Very, very interesting talk. Any question? Questions so far? I do have a couple of questions. Maybe mm -hmm. ask it too, and uh, then maybe we can talk sure. about the uh, offline. So, sure. so one is about this. So when you mentioned this uh, uniqueness, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a different choice of the, so usually the regularization you choose is like a projection to the convex set. Yes. So, 
So that's one choice. You can also just add some functions. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Let's say you, you choose some organization. Do, I'm I'm curious about the sort of sort of the reconstruction guarantee, right? Do you have a zero fidelity once you choose? How do you get the? Oh, uh, because it's, it's, have, it's yeah. unique, but that that one may not be the the same as what you want to recover, right? Yeah, so what I said is that uh, you can treat that as the data fidelity term, uh, but that term is not going to be zero when you minimize it. Yes. Uh, what you get is just a minimum value. So let me yeah, yeah, that. that's 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 my question. So what, yeah. what kind of uh, RT you can choose such that you can really you guarantee the reconstruction? That's one of the example I'm actually here. If the matrix, if the cost is symmetric, and uh, the is that if it's that if it's the discrete case, if it's symmetric and the diagonal is zero, then it's guaranteed to be a unique recovery. Yeah, but, but but if even it's unique, but that that one the, the reconstruction may not be the same as the ground truth, right? Well, if your if your the ground truth what if your pi hat was generated using this cost, then it's guaranteed to recover the same cost. Say if your pi hat was given was generated by that uh, cost matrix, which is a symmetric and uh, with diagonal zero, then uh, what do you recover using the inverse OT here will be exactly the same as the original one. But I should I I thought you should ask the fidelity is also zero. If fidelity does oh, not fidelity is minimized. Okay. Uh, I'm I don't think it would be it would be eventually zero. But, um, but it's like a compatibility condition, right? So you, you have <laughs> you the, the, the corresponding C alpha beta C should be compatible with whatever the transportation plan you have. Yes. But anyway, okay, I see. But it will be me, man. I, I, I'm not. I'm not because one hundred percent sure if it will reach to C. But the point is that you can minimize. Uh, if you take, for example, if you just ignore this first term, then you sure. take the first order derivative for each R and beta C. You plug in this back in. You said to you get zero. Sure. So that's for sure. Sure. So that's what I mean. So even you have a uniqueness, but that unique solution may not be the same as the ground source. Well, if you don't have this actual term, yes, there will be infinite many. There are actually infinite many solutions that can yes. that can they all satisfy the first order condition here. Huh. But it's just that it may not be the one you want. Yeah, that's 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 yeah. my yeah. But my you want point. to recover something you want. For example, you want to say your cost was generated from a uh, distance. Then you know that it should be symmetric, and you know yeah. that the at diagonal it should be zero. Yeah. And then you do need to worry about the triangle inequality, which is will be very difficult to handle in here, since you need exactly. to worry about Cij is less than or equal to Cik plus Ckj. There are lots yeah. of inequality constraints introduced here. But yeah. what we, what our work can do is that you can ignore that, you can yeah. delete those, and you can still recover the original one. That's the elegance of this one. Yeah, I, that, I think that's a really nice uh, property. Uh, here. Yeah. Well, and that's it, not just for discrete case. For continuous case, it's, too, it's the same thing. Yeah. Uh, if your cost C is in, symmetric in X and Y, and then mm -hmm. C X X is equal to zero, then mm -hmm. you can still guarantee a unique recovery. And this, as I said, this includes all the distance uh -huh. uh, or something, uh, some variation of distance, like a square of the distance. I see. I see. Yeah. The other question is about the, when you when you mention this equivalence between your two um, optimization. Uh, 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 model, right? One is like a double, two, 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 two yeah, level. Yeah, it's a bi level. Why is the bi level? The other one is like a. So this is also true for this uh, non entropy regularized version, right? The only well, thing is you. That the issue is that um, if you do the right unregularized OT or original OT, uh, the do the primal problem, a primal solution cannot be easily written as the, oh. the due form. So you cannot do that substitution. That's the issue. But the full, but if we just do the modeling, that would be okay. At least yeah. for the level problem, you can still print yeah, it in that way. You yeah. just you cannot get this nice, uh, nice unconstrained convex problem. No, you will not get unconstrained, but you can write it in the, in in this. Uh, well, it's not double double level. You can still you write can, a, You can still write the form, but you do have constraint, and yeah. uh, with that, it will be difficult to solve then. Well, alpha beta constraints like a, in, in, you have an inequality constraint like right. summation. That would be alpha plus beta I'm less than equal to yeah, C, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's convex. Exactly, you can do something there. Yeah, exactly. That that, that but the inequality constraint is usually it's still difficult to handle. Yeah, yeah. But here it's nice, and you do need to worry it about. It's very nice. It's very nice. 
Yeah, but 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 the entropy organization, uh, yeah, yeah, I see, I see. Very interesting. Okay, okay, nice, super nice. So, any any other, I mean, high dimension problem you 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 have? Uh, we we tried a color transfer for high dimension. Okay, so what the? Uh, I, I'm not quite. Uh, how should I say? I, I don't know what is application actual application of this. Uh, doing a color, for example, you have two pictures, a color image. Uh -huh. You know that you can treat each image. Uh, if you if you track all those those pixels, you can think of them as a, a cloud point in a three dimensional space, mm -hmm. RGB, right? Yep. And then you have two of these images. You have two clouds, and the people want to see. Maybe I can show you one of the pictures. Uh, Uh, probably cannot. It's still on overlay. Sorry. It's just in that you have two color images. Yeah. And, uh, and say I, I, one I has lots of red, for example, uh -huh. and uh, the other one has some blue. And then when uh -huh. you match, you know that maybe you think that this is some painter. They have certain preference to to put some picture in certain color format or color color theme. So what you can do is, uh, if you some people do four load here just to match the two, so that one picture. Originally, it looks pretty much like a red color, but after the matching, it becomes a uh, pretty much blue colored uh, image. Yeah. But if you do the inverse OT, this like that, you know, you figure you figure out what is the underlying cost to make uh -huh. the color matching, and then you can use this cost to do some new color transfer. Yeah, I understand. Turn from the image to a different colored image. I see. I see. I see. I see. Very interesting. So, any any more question so far? So if no more question, let's thank Xiaojing again for this very interesting talk. Thank you. That's, that's the end of the talk today. Okay, so I'll see. So we don't have a seminar uh, 